Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Napoleon McClinton, and let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come today to thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you, Lord, that you have watched over us throughout last night as we slumbered and as we slept, and that you have gotten us up this morning and given us a heart and a mind to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We pray now, Father, for this church. We pray for each and every member. We pray, Father, for those that are put in positions of leadership. We pray that you would keep us together as a church family and keep us safe, and that we would become the kind of church that you have called us to be, and that is a Christ-centered church where others would come to know you through your darling son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for those that are sick and afflicted among us. We pray, Father, for those that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones. We pray, Father, for those that are dealing with the many issues surrounding their lives. The economic slowdown, the global pandemic, the fears of the rise in inflation and the downturn in the economy. We pray also, Father, for those who are dealing with those issues concerning the natural disasters that we see, the raging fires out on the West Coast, the flooding that we see, Father, in East Kentucky. We pray also, Father, for those that are dealing with the wars and things that we see overseas, especially for those victims in Ukraine. We pray, Father, that you would comfort each and every one and that, Father, they would find some satisfaction, some relief in knowing, Father, that you promise in your word that you would never leave them, nor will you ever forsake them. We pray, Father, for those that are guilty of committing such crimes against humanity. We pray that you would hold them accountable, Father, one day, and that they would stand before your judgment seat and give an account for the deeds done in their bodies. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension back to heaven, and for the ascending or the coming of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, to be the people that you want us to be, and that is a people that you taught and you told that we need to love one another. And also, Father, that if we love you, we would obey your command. Help us to be obedient to your word. In your precious son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, I want to say thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study as we continue to look at our summer 2022 uh, quarterly topic which has to do with partners in a new creation. And so we began a new unit for the month of August and that brings us to our second lesson, the August 14 lesson. Our unit study has been about the great hope of the saints. And so today's lesson, which is lesson 11, has to deal with a new city. As we study from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 10 through 21 of the New International Version of the Bible. And we see on our screen the agenda for today's study, and it's divided into two teaching outlines. Our first outline has to do with the city's descent. As we look in Revelations chapter 21, verse 10 through 14. Our second outline has to do with the city's detail. As we look in Revelation chapter 21, verse 15 through 21, and all our scripture will be read from the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's look at our scripture reading for today, which is also on the screen. And our title is A New City for today's lesson. As we look at the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 10 through 21 of the New International Version of the Bible. And let's begin reading at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. 
It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring wad of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as, well as, and as width and height as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements as it was 144 cubit thick. The walls were made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundation of the city wall was decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jason, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so next we look at our lesson context for today's study, which is also on our screen, as we've been looking at a, the title, A New City, from the book of Revelations, Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 through 30, of the NIV version of the Bible, or the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's begin reading our lesson context for today. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 through 21, the apostle John sees a great city coming down from the heavens. He described it in a manner that stirs the hearts of believers for what they can expect. Prophetic visions of a city of God were not uncommon in biblical and Jewish texts. The psalmist described the beauty of the city of God, forever made secure by the presence of God in Psalm number 48. The prophet Isaiah envisioned the centrality of God's city, Jerusalem, in the last days in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. This new Jerusalem would be the source of joy for all people, of all God's people, in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 through 19. And I quote verse 17 through 19. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Tobit, which is a Jewish text written in the intertestamental, uh, intertestamental period, describes a heavenly Jerusalem very similar to John's vision. The city would be rebuilt with precious stones and gold. It would become a place where the God of Israel would be worshiped. In Tobit 13, 16018, a vision of the prophet Ezekiel provides the most notable Old Testament comparison to John's vision. Ezekiel was taken to a mountain and shown a vision of what appeared to be a city in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2. 
The book of Ezekiel's vision included the dimensions of a heavenly temple and its court to reflect God's glory. In Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 5 through chapter 43, verse 12. The vision included a life-giving river flowing from the temple in Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 and 2. And the boundaries and divisions of a re-established Israel in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 13 through chapter 48, verse 29. The vision culminates as Ezekiel sees the gates and dimensions of the city in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 30 through 35. A close comparison between the visions of Ezekiel and John will reveal differences. However, John's vision is in fundamental harmony with the theological tradition that was at the heart of Ezekiel's vision. Throughout history, God's people have held firmly to the truth that God will provide for his people at the end time. These visions, while not necessarily depicting a physical location, nevertheless points to God's faithfulness to his people. And so now our lesson begins in Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 through 14 of the New International Version of the Bible, as we look at this holy city, this new Jerusalem, as it descends from heaven. And so let's look at the eternal glory as we look at verses 10 and 11, which is on the screen, which are on the screen. Beginning reading at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And so in, John, in, in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 a, we see that John says he was carried away in the spirit by one of the seven angels that we read about in Revelation chapter 21, verse 9 from last week's lesson. This was a vision because it took place in the spirit and it was on the Lord's day, as we see in John chapter 1, verse 10, as well as chapter 4, verse 2, and chapter 17, verse 3. The prophet Ezekiel describes being taken to a mountain where he saw a heavenly city and a rebuilt temple in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2 through 4. And so now we see in verse 10b of today's study that John saw this holy city called Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So God will establish this holy city, the new Jerusalem, the place where he will dwell with his people, his bride, which is the church. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 from last week's study. Many prophets, however, held expectant hope of a new Jerusalem or for a new Jerusalem. Zechariah the prophet anticipated the manifestation of the Lord's glory in this city in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, as well as chapter 10, verse 13. God's people would be gathered in peace among the nations in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3 through 6, as well as verses 20 through 23. Isaiah highlighted the new Jerusalem splendor in God's new heaven and in his new earth in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 through 19, as a city that was adorned with jewels in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11 and 12. So John's vision of the city coming down out of heaven serves as a representation of God's relationship with his people, with humanity. God's city, his dwelling place, will come down to be among his people. Meditation between God and his people will no longer be needed because they will be in the very presence of God. 
God will be present with his people in this new Jerusalem. That the city is from God reminds his people of the focus of their worship. Their worship is to be directed to the Alpha and the Omega, to the beginning and the end, as we read in last week's lesson in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. God is worthy of the highest praise and honor from the citizens, which is the bride of Christ, which is the church of this new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 29, verse 9. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. And so as John saw God's glory, which was evident in the holy city, the new Jerusalem, he fell down in worship in Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. But we know from that he fell down to worship an angel, and the angel told him don't do that because he was a, a, a servant of the Lord just as John was. But John was so amazed with the beauty and the awesomeness of this city that he had the need and he felt the need to worship. And that's what we ought to be wanting to do uh, ourselves is to worship God for his splendor, for his glory, and for his honor. And so in verse 11, we see that the new Jerusalem, the holy city, shone with the glory of God. As it states in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, and I quote, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. John likened its brilliance to that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper which is clear as crystal. John referred to a very precious jewel to provide a tangible parallel to the radiance of God's glory. However, John was trying to describe some in heaven using human language, which was almost near impossible to do. But John was trying to make sure that he gave us, those that would read his book, at least a clear vision, a clear understanding of what he saw. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, John describes God as the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby and a rainbow that shone like an emerald that encircled the throne. And so John's vision in, agrees with that of the earlier heavenly visions in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, where Isaiah saw the glory of Zion, which is the city of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 through 2, where Ezekiel spoke about God's glory as he returns to the temple of the Lord, uh, and it would also be there in Jerusalem. And so next we look at the external perspective as John describes the city from an external perspective. And so let's look at verses 12 through 14, and let's read it together, which is on the screen. Beginning at verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 lambs of the apostles. Uh, which were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so next, I want us to look at this chart, which describes this new city in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 through 13, and the relationship that we see as John looked from an external perspective in verse 12 through 14. John describes the uh, city as having 12 foundations, and on these 12 foundations were written the names of the 12 tribe of Israel, as well as the 12 apostles. And from this chart, we can see their connection to the Lamb of God, which is Christ Jesus. These 12 tribes were a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he would make a great nation out of them, and that out of Abraham's seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. 
And so Jesus came down through the lineage of the tribe of Judah. And so we can see there that Jesus is connected back through these 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the 12 apostles were those that Jesus had commissioned that had been his disciples and that he had used to give the great commission to go forth into all the world and to preach the gospel. Now, we see the listing of those 12 apostles, and we note that uh, Matthias was the one that replaced Judas, who ultimately uh, crucified himself. And as the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim in the 12 tribes of Israel, those were the descendants of Joseph. And so now we look at the explanation of verse 12, and we see that this great high wall with 12 great, uh, 12 gates displays God's glory and the purity of God in Revelation chapter 21, verse 26 through 27. In John's vision here, the heavenly city's enemies have been destroyed from Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 10, as well as verse 13 through 15. There are no evil uh, enemies of God there in this holy city. All of that has been destroyed in the earlier chapters of John, as we read from John chapter 4 all the way through. This last part of John's book is talking about this new Jerusalem that John, God is going to bring down from heaven for his people, and ultimately how he's going to restore the, the, the uh, Garden of Eden there in the new Jerusalem. And so we see here that the 12 gates sort of parallels Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 30 through 34, where each gate is named for a tribe of Israel. In John's vision, all the names of the 12 tribes of Israel seems to be listed on each one of the 12 gates. The 12 tribes of Israel were the foundation for God's people uh, as God had promised through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and also they became part of the foundation for this new Jerusalem, and that's why they are listed there on the foundation in John's vision. John's vision reassures all who would hear all of God's people will be included in this new Jerusalem. In Hebrew chapter 39, chapter 11, verse 39 through 40. Now in verse 13, the, there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west, and these would be the 12 gates to the city. These 12 gates, though, would never be closed because there would be no evil there in the city, nor would there be any enemies of God. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, John describes this great city and the great multitude that's there. And I quote Revelation chapter, chapter 7, verse 9 through 10. The great multitude in white robes. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so we see in verse 14 of today's study that these 12 foundations that would have been visible as this new Jerusalem descended from heaven in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. On the 12 foundations were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. The earliest Christians considered the apostles and the ancient prophets, prophets to be the foundation of the church, with Christ being the Lamb of God as the cornerstone or as the chief cornerstone. From Paul's writing in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. So John's, visions, or John's vision highlights God's work in salvation's history. The presence of both Israel 
uh, in the form of the 12 tribes of Israel, and the church emphasizes the scope of God's covenant people. In the new Jerusalem, all God's people will be united so that God's glory might be on display in this new Jerusalem. And so next, John gives us from his vision details of this city. As we look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 21, and we look at the measurements that is taken by the angel that is escorting John as he is caught up in the spirit and carried into the holy city, and he sees things that God tells him, uh, Jesus tells him that he would be shown things that was, things that are, and things that are to be. And so let's read verse 15 through 17 concerning the measurements, which is on the screen. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. In verse 15, the angel who talked with John, who was his giving him an escort or his tour guide, used his rod to measure, which was made of gold, to measure the city and to measure its gates, and to measure its walls. The act of measuring of these items reveal the perfection of God's handiwork. Now in verse 16, the angel measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadium in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The dimension of the New Jerusalem demonstrates the city's holiness. It is a visual representation of the statement that Ezekiel write in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35, and I quote, And the name of the city from that time on will be, The Lord is there. So God in his glory will live with his people in the new Jerusalem from Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, which we studied in last week's lesson. The New Jerusalem is the most holiest place uh, in the world, uh, the most holiest place on the, this new earth and on, in, in this new city because the old Jerusalem had been passed away. And those things would be remembered no more uh, as we read in the book of Isaiah. So now 12,000 stadia is approximately 1,300 miles to give you some idea of the breadth of this city. John's vision, though, is conveying what the Lord wanted to show him regarding the expanse and the role of the new Jerusalem. It will be a place where God's glory is evident and clearly obvious and where all of God's people will be assembled there to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, God's people from every area will worship him in this new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, as well as Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, where we saw all of those people that could not be numbered were dressed in white robe, and they were saying salvation is from our God and from the Lamb. And, and also in Revelation chapter 21, verse 24 through 26. Now, in verse 17, the angel chose to use, uh, measure the wall using human measurement because he measured it and it was considered to be 144 cubic thick. Now, a cubic is considered to be a foot and a half or 18 inches, the length of an average sized man from his elbow down to the tip of his finger. So the wall's dimension properly, properly or possibly represents the 144,000 people that had been redeemed that is noted in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, as well as in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Their inclusion in the city's design 
along with the 12 tribes of Israel, as well as the 12 apostles of the Lamb of Jesus. And the prophets acknowledged the totality of God's people in the holy city in the New Jerusalem. All of those that have confessed faith in God through belief in his son, Jesus Christ, and through obeying God and obeying his word will ultimately be in this New Jerusalem because God has promised, Jesus has promised that he would prepare that place for us. And so we see how lavishly the material is used to lay out this new Jerusalem. As we look at verses 18 through 21, and we look at the material. And so let's begin reading at verse 18, which is on the screen. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundation of the city walls was decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jason and the 12th amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And so from verse 18a, John describes the city walls as being of the same material that was used in Revelation chapter four, verse three. The radiance of the brilliancy of God's presence surround the city in Revelation chapter 21, verse 19. In verse 18b, the inclusion of gold in the eternal city might be making a reference to the original garden paradise in Genesis chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. Gold indicated the very presence of God. Gold was a common uh, material used in constructing the whole city. The New Jerusalem purity was unparalleled, unpar unparalleled, making it pure as glass, which was more refined than human hands can produce. In other words, there were no impurities in any of these precious jewels that we see or the gold that we see used in, uh, in the construction of this city that was made by God. And so now we look at verse 19 and 20, and we see in verse 19 and 20 that the foundation of the city walls were to be decorated with every kind of precious stone. And that was somewhat unusual, but it was also indicative of the city's heavenly nature. God does not reserve splendor or grandeur in the construction of his city. The prophet Isaiah had foretold that Jerusalem would be rebuilt with precious stones and gems in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11 and 12. The beauty of the new Jerusalem stands in direct contrast to earthly beauty as we read in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, and the temporary wealth of earthly wealth as we also read in Revelation chapter 18, verse 12, which has to do with the lament of the fall of the great evil city or the great Babylon. And so we see that the specific listing of these precious stones that we have just read about is found only in verse 19 through 20. However, specific stones are cited throughout Scripture. God on his throne and the glory of God are both imagined with the appearance of jasper and ruby, a stone older tra uh, translation of scripture might call Sardis in Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. The deep blue shade of sapphire invites comparison to a lapis lazuli, another stone known for its blue shade in Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. Modern understanding of agate sometimes called chalcedonian, view it as a type of quartz. Although its meaning here in today's scripture is quite unclear. But now in Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, John describes a rainbow 
that shine like an emerald surrounding God's throne. Now in Revelation chapter 20 of today's study, it is the only mention of these particular precious stones or precious jewels, which is chrysolite, beryl, topaz, turquoise, jason, and amethyst in the New Testament. The New Jerusalem is without a temple because there is no need for a mediator to work uh, of the priest to be done because it's no longer needed because God is in their presence. In other words, God dwells with his people as he dwells among kings um, of priests from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, as well as from Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, as well as Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. So the foundation of these stones serve as an outerwear for the heavenly city, such as when a priest would have his uh, outfit, the high priest would have his outer garment uh, equipped with precious stones. Now the bride, which turns out to be those that God has chosen and are God's redeemed people, have readied herself for the marriage with the bridegroom. The heavenly city is described as the bride, the wife of the lamb, which is Jesus, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 9, as well as chapter 21, verse 2. The city's ornament and precious jewels are like those worn by a bride on her wedding day, as Isaiah points out in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. The precious and beautiful stone inlaid in the foundation of the New Jerusalem highlight the precious and beauty of God's created acts of God's created work. Each unique stone shows us that God is a God of beauty as well as a God of purpose. The psalmist declares that from Zion, perfect in beauty, God would shine forth in Psalm number 50 verse 2. Imagine you worshiping the God, the creator, the great God, the Holy One of Israel in this heavenly city one day. In verse 21a, we see that the gates of the heavenly city included 12 angels and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, and each gate was a single pearl. Now, pearls were considered to be extremely valuable and enormously costly in the New Testament, as Jesus talked about the man in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45 through 46, that found a great pearl in the city and he went and sold everything he owned so he could buy that piece of land. So now given the thickness uh, or the size of the walls, which was somewhere around 144 cubit, which would equate to 72 yards or 216 feet, these pearls would have been unnaturally huge or large and unfathomably valuable. In verse 21b, they see that the holy city, as John has described from his vision, displays incredible beauty. John's vision of the great street of the city of, was gold, as pure as transparent glass. In other words, the gold itself was pure, more refined than any possible gold could be done on earth. And it's more refined and more valuable than its human equivalents. Anything that had made by man could not be as pure and as undefiled as things that were made and put in God's holy city, the New Jerusalem. So then God's glory and the idea of life are represented by this great street. John's vision of the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and flowing down the middle of this great street of gold is described in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. The tree of life stood on both sides of the street of gold, this great street of gold, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. So God displays beauty for his people. But more importantly, God will bring this new eternal life 
Ultimately, God will restore his creation for his glory. And so this river of life is symbolic of eternal life, that all, all of those that enter into this new Jerusalem one day will be there eternally in this new life with God and will be praising God and worshiping God forever and forever. So let's look at our conclusion, which is on the screen. And it talks about this new Jerusalem, that there will be no place like it. Not on earth. Only place you'll find something like that is coming down from heaven in the new Jerusalem and on the new earth. And so let's read our conclusion. The Apostle John used vivid language to describe a glorious and splendid heavenly city. Unlike earthly city, the heavenly city glows with the brightness of God's glory. God's glory shines through the city, more vivid and illuminating than sunlight. Our hope as believers is that we will someday worship God in that beautiful heavenly city. There will be no more place like it, or there will be no place like it because that will be the place where God's city is, is. And that will be the place where those that are hold on and to their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will spend all eternity worshiping God. And so our thought for to remember for today's study is that God's glory is evident for all to see. Even now it's evidence for all to see when we look at this beautiful earth that God has created and everything that he has planted in it and used in it. But one day he's going to destroy all of that, but he's going to re uh, recreate. As a matter of fact, he's going to make all things new. And so in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, John writes of his vision, and let's just read it. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises that we read about in the book of Revelation. For you allowed John on the Lord's day to be caught up in the spirit and to get a peek behind the curtain into heaven. And to see how one day, Father, all of the promise that you have made to those over the years that have trusted in you and your son, Jesus, will be complete. And that we will spend all eternity in this beautiful new Jerusalem as your bride that's adorned in all of these precious Jews awaiting to be married to the Lamb, as to the Son of God, to Jesus. Help us, Father, to hold on to these promises and to, by faith, live a life that's proven and, and, and possible and bring glory and honor to your name here on earth. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I thank you for joining us for today's study. I pray that God will keep you safe and that God will bless you each and every day. Thank you. Oh, I'm determined to see Jesus, and I know that he will welcome me. He has promised to prepare a mansion there I dwell through all eternity. I'll keep singing as I go. I'm some Oh, <laughs>